Hi, and welcome to module four of lecture seven, covering how to compute probabilities. Now, in the previous module, we dealt with rules of probability and um, notation and things like that. And we dealt with stuff like this, right? The probability of A and B equals what? Well, what we didn't deal with was how to compute probability of A. Now, in a lot of examples, we're not gonna have to do that ever. It'll be a parameter of the model or the scenario, right? So for instance, in game theory, you might have some prior belief about some opponent's type, that they're gonna be mean or nice. You can assign a probability P to the fact that they might be nice. That's a parameter of the model. You'll go through and solve your model, keeping that parameter as is, and you'll list your results in terms of that parameter. By this I mean you don't have to ever calculate it yourself. You find critical values of the parameter and so on, but you won't ever have to actually calculate a single numerical value of that parameter based on some other thing. So that's true for some cases. In some other cases, you can assume it. And a lot of times this will be a distribution, like say in Bayesian statistics, um, when you're trying to come up with a prior distribution, you might make up uninformative priors and have a distribution there. That again, is not something you have to compute, you'll be assuming it. And we'll deal with that kind of thing more in the next couple lectures, not for Bayesian stats, because that's not part of this class, but the idea of distributions. However, there are some cases, particularly in game theory, where you're gonna to have to actually go through and calculate out um, some probability. Usually this involves some kind of combinatorics. Combinatorics are ways to tell you how to go about figuring out the numbers of ways to arrange certain things. For instance, let's take five elements. We did six in the book. Let's take a five here. And let's ask how to arrange this such that we get sets of three. How many ways can we draw three elements from this set without replacement? Well, one way to do this is to sort of use the, um, is to use the, well, let's do this first. So A, um, B, C is one way, A, B, D is another way, A, B, E. Then we can go A, C, D. A, C, E, right? Just going through all the combinations here. Then A, D, E, that's all the ones that involve A. Then for B, you get B, C, D, B, C, E, and B, D, E, those are all the ones that involve B. And finally, C, D, E is the only one that involves C, but not A and B. So that's it, we can count. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have ten things here. Now, you might ask reasonably, why did you just do that? Well, think back to the laws of classical probability, which says that the chance that something happens is equal to the chance, the number of ways that that event might happen, divided by the number of ways all events might happen, the number of outcomes in the sample space. If we're trying to actually compute the probability, we can rely upon that rule of classical probability, but only if we can compute the number of ways things happen. We did that a little bit with dice, where we talked about how many ways you can get different die rolls, but oftentimes you have more complicated scenarios than just how many ways you can get three from two numbers. Here, we're trying to figure out the total number of ways you can get, you can draw three elements out of five, if now you want to ask, what's the chance that you get A, B, E while drawing three elements? Well, there are 10 total ways of getting three elements and one way of getting A, B, E, so it's one tenth. Right? Assuming you're drawing three elements, there's one tenth way of getting A, B, E, assuming the order doesn't matter here. Okay. So we can do this by hand and draw it out. And in some cases, we actually have to go through and list all the possible ways of getting something to figure out probabilities, right? It happens sometimes. If there's no nice pattern, you have to go through and figure out exactly what the chances are of getting every each particular um, event, and then add up the number of events that fit your definition, your compound event, and then divide by the total number of possible events that fit your category. In this case, we specified there was, we're trying to draw three elements, so that's gonna be the denominator, all possible things here, and the particular one we care about, the particular event we care about is drawing A, B, E. So that would be one over 10. Is there a better way of doing this in general? The answer is yes. 
To figure out the number of ways of drawing three elements in general, we can use something called a combination. A combination tells us how many ways there are of drawing k elements out of n. In this case, the combination, and combination is written often like this. This is written, this is read as n choose k. You sometimes often see different, um, I'm not gonna, in the book there are different ways of writing that, we're gonna stick with this one. Um, this is a, by far the more common one. n choose k means how many ways can I choose k elements out of n if I don't care about the order. Now, turns out, example, this is pretty simple. It's n factorial over k factorial, n minus k factorial. If we call a factorial equals k times k minus one, times k minus two, times dot, 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 one, which is k minus k. That's a factorial. Also zero factorial equals one. So that's how we're, that's it. So let's put the numbers in here. We had five elements. So we have five factorial divided by three factorial, because we're choosing three at a time, times five minus three, which is two factorial. That equals five factorial is five times four times three times two times one divided by three times two times one um, times two times one. The three times two times one cancels. You have 20 on top, you have two in the bottom, that equals 10. And lo and behold, we have the right answer. This formula tells us exactly how many ways um, of drawing three things out of five. That's a simpler way of computing the denominator in the formula for classical probability, for defining a probability of a particular event, is to use a combination, to use combinations. Combinations are by far the most common type of combinatorics that we end up using in social sciences because oftentimes we don't care about the order of things, we're just trying to figure out how to get something. Um, you know, the number of ways of winning $5 or whatever, right? If we're using some kind of game theory problem, we might care about the number of ways of winning $5. That's the kind of thing we often see for combinatorics um, for the pro for calculating probability in game theory. However, um, sometimes we might care about the order. If we do, we use what's called a permutation. A permutation is the number of ways of drawing k things out of n things, taking into account the order. When you take into account the order, you discover that, for instance, A, B, E is different from B, E, A, and so on, that the order actually matters. Turns out that the formula is relatively similar. It's the exact same formula without the k factorial because there are k factorial ways of arranging um, k objects. So for instance, for three, write A, B, E, A, E, B, B, A, E, B, E, A, E, A, B, E, B, A. There's six ways of arranging three things. Three factorial is three times two times one, which is six. So that tells you, so removing the division by k factorial increases the number of possible ways of doing something by k factorial, which is the number of different ways of arranging six things, different orders. Again, you see permutations much less than combinations. These are permutations. Because to permute something means to change the order. These are combinations. And those are by far the most two common ways we have of going about trying to compute sort of core probabilities in the um, presence of classical probability. This comes up sometimes, it's not a ton of times, but it does come up quite often in game theory when you're trying to, well, semi-often in game theory when you're trying to compute probabilities of outcomes in order to calculate things like expected utility. All this stuff we'll talk much more about in the next two um, lectures when we discuss probability distributions. This is just sort of a heads up for exactly what we're gonna be doing there. The other way these come up a lot is in specific distributions. This n choose k comes up in the, in the um, binomial distribution. So it'll be an element of distributions because the coefficient on different distributions um, will be actually combinatorics because there's different ways of getting particular combinations of ones and zeros. 
You might also see this as, um, as elements of polynomial expansions when you're trying to expand, say, x plus y to the nth. Each of the terms will have a certain number of x's and a certain number of y's in them. The coefficient in front of them will be a combinatorics, will be a combination just like this. Sorry, combination, not combinatorics. So you see these things pretty semi-often. It's not a common thing, so don't spend too much time stressing about it if it's confusing. But it does come up, and this is uh, this is how you um, compute them. Okay. Next time, we're going to think we spend much, much more time doing in political science and social sciences more generally, which is Bayes' rule. Thank you very much.